Yes, we're going live right now. Yes, can you hear me? Testing. Yes, I can clear? hear you perfectly. Um, Perfect. Freddie, can you hear me and can you hear Jamil? I can. Okay, awesome. We are live, guys. We are live. Uh, so welcome fun. to this live stream. Uh, we are talking about how to finance your real estate empire, uh, and uh, we are glad that you're joining us. Please let us know where you're joining us from, what's your first name, and share the life. Okay, life, sh sh share it, because sharing is caring, so we can have as many people as possible. Uh, we have one more minute here to bring on as many people as we can. I'm going to share the live also on my platforms. Uh, Freddie, have you shared? the live yet i'm gonna do that right now and watch that oh i'm hearing echo now okay freddie can you speak i feel like i, I, I could hear an echo you you say i i can still hear myself and i don't think it's normal you're hearing wonder... yourself because <laughs> my my audio is playing uh through my AirPods, I, I hope it's not affecting anything on your end. No, um, I can hear so. you perfectly, Jamil, but I'm I, I'm really worried about um about Freddie not hearing us, but he's hearing himself. Freddie, we don't have any concern with your audio though. We could hear you perfectly, and it's not coming. I can hear you. Okay, good. Yeah. Um, Jamil, can you hear Freddie? Yes, I can hear everyone. Perfect. I think we can go ahead. Um, Lionel, thank you for joining us from Miami. Oh, yeah, you were referred by your big brother. That's awesome. All right, guys, just give me one second. I am trying to find a way to share the link um, on YouTube. I don't know if there's a way for me to find us on YouTube because there are people that are not on Facebook, and YouTube would have been their only option. Um, okay. Give me one second. So how, how was your week, Jamil? Week has been great. I'm just, it's like, I feel like it's been a blink of an eye, you know. Just it went by fast. Like, wow, it's Friday. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah, that you know, went by just been really fast. Super busy. Uh, my younger brother, who was in high school, mm -hmm. is uh, wrapping up his basketball season. So mm -hmm. we're approaching the, uh, you know, the final stages here and, and try to advance as far as we can with the state championship and, and so forth. So looking forward, he has actually a game tomorrow. So yeah, looking forward to that. How's everything on your end? Pretty good. Pretty good. It's been amazing for me this beginning of the year. It's pretty, it's going pretty fast. Um, and I'm, I'm happy with what's happening. It's a lot of people that are now interested in real estate and investing in real estate. And I'm happy about that because my, uh, my biggest thing has always been to educate people around me and show them right. the importance of investing in real estate. A lot of them are reacting now. And right. one of them, one of them is my nephew. You know, I'm so mm. happy. Uh, my nephew is only, about 26 if i'm not mistaken and he has he 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 makes good money like he he's an engineer it engineer he makes about two hundred thousand dollars a year wow. and so far he was renting so uh hmm. now we are on the contract in dallas dallas for nice. four. we have a beautiful house for him and his wife they just they just had their first baby so i'm as wow. an auntie i'm proud as a realtor i'm yes. proud you know i'm just so proud at you know on many levels but the yeah. year really started on a very good note for me um what very about good. you Katie? well this has been a very good week as, as you know that's time it's my time so <laughs> when i start to see the money i'm happy and um, we've been like really busy and I like being busy. Yeah. And so um, uh, Jamil, just so you know, uh, Freddie here is um, mm -hmm. is into car, uh, the car business. He's, he's into the automobile business oh. and he has uh, multiple dealerships in okay. uh, North Carolina, Hickory, North oh, wow. Carolina. So he's, he, if you ever if you ever need to purchase a property in that area, you, you know your expert is right here. Um, so I'm I'm very happy for you, Freddie. This is tax season. 
Um, I'm going to fight with you for clients who want to either buy a house or buy a car. So, but you know, <laughs> it's exactly. not totally all right. That's great. Super. I wish I knew that because I actually just um, I just got myself a new a new Jeep Cherokee. You know, nothing uh, nothing too, you know, I guess exotic, but uh, it was definitely a a level up for me. That's and, so uh, nice. Yeah. That's good. Happy, yeah, happy about that's that. amazing. Well, congratulations on your new Thank car. You. Uh, but now you know that Freddie is the yeah. expert of the automobile. Now um, I know. I just want to welcome all, uh, you know, all the viewers tonight. We have Stefan, uh, Yves Dikume. Yves Dikume is a broker. He's a real estate broker based in New York. So if any of you here watching, you are in New York and you need a property, reach out to Yves Dikume. You can find him on social media by his name, um, Yves Dikume. And we also have Yan Yapi. Welcome, Yan. Uh, we also have Emerence. Emerence um, is already a member of the Millionaire Movement. Welcome. Erin, welcome. We also have uh, Junior Mekinda, who is a great leader in the community here, um, the Cameroonian community and also the African community in general in New York. Uh, we have Lionel from Miami. So welcome to all of you. Modesto, you're here too. Uh, Modest is also a member of the Millionaire Movement. And Jamil, you've seen a lot about the Millionaire Movement, um, you know, that we started a couple of years ago with the idea that, it, you know, people have to start learning in our community. They have to start learning to invest mm -hmm. in um, passive, you know, in, in a passive income uh, assets, right? And things like uh, owning stocks, you know, or owning real estate, things that could generate um, more money other than the money that they're already making from their business or from their uh, job. So, and that right. movement started, uh, it started small, but now we are a lot of us and we just acquired uh, our first property, um, you know, as a group, not just personally. On, on a personal level, a lot of us have been acquiring properties and that's amazing. Uh, but now, we are we we went uh with something that we call in Cameroon or in Africa in general we call it a don team so we put our mm. money we pull yes. of you know some funds together and we purchase a property it's something that we're very very proud of and I want to take this opportunity to congratulate everyone who was part of that first quarter of the millionaire movement and uh you know with this purchase that we 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 just made and i want to also encourage everyone who is interested in joining um the millionaire real estate team or the millionaire movement in general send us a message you can send a message to um, one of the admins it can be modest he's on this live today it can be myself um you know but please reach out do not hesitate if you have any questions guys welcome we also have george George is also a great, great, great uh, real estate investor, um, and I, I can't, I can't do anything here without acknowledging how he has impacted my perception of real estate in general. I was very scared of real estate, you know, but when I started talking to him and saw that he was buying multi-families in Chicago and all of those places, I was like, how is this? How is he doing this? Like, I thought. This was something for white people. <laughs> I'm so sorry to say that. But, you know, by just seeing my brother do something like that just inspired me. And this is what we want to continue to do. So thank you, George, for joining us tonight. So without further ado, we're going to get started, guys. We have Sergio, Giselle, welcome. Judith from California. We also have Makwe from New Jersey. We have the entire... Hey, New United Jersey. <laughs> and Markway, please reach out to Jamil. He's your neighbor in New Jersey. Reach out yes. to him. Get, get, get your home, you know, your home loan from him. So, guys, if you're ready, Jamil, are you ready? I am ready. Ready to go. Awesome. Guys, please give us some love there in the comment section. You know, send send us send us your love. Encourage us because we're going to have a great conversation tonight. We're talking about building your real estate empire. You have to start somewhere. So we need some encouragement from you, right? Envoyez les coeurs. Envoyez les coeurs. <laughs> we need some likes. We need some love. Anything that you can do. All right, Freddie, I'm going to give you the opportunity to ask Jamil uh, the first question here tonight, uh, because we want to touch everyone. Uh, 
We want to touch first time home buyers. We want to touch investors. We want to touch um, you know, anyone, even if you're just looking for a second home, whatever you need, we want to be able to touch you tonight. But we want to go step by step and start at, you know, from the bottom up. Somebody who has never bought a house. Freddie, what can you ask Jamil about it? A lot of questions for him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Go with the first one. one. <laughs> okay. Um, for instance, I'm first time home buyer. Like, I never purchased a home before. What are the steps that you recommend me to take in order for me to acquire my property maybe in the next two, three months? Great. Yeah, so I think um, what I always say is the first step in all of it is to, to just confirm that you are in a financial position uh, in order to take on, you know, the potential payment for the home, right? There's oftentimes people are like, you know, I want a five or six or $700,000 home. Um, but when it comes, you know, when it comes time to delivering what that payment is going to be, Sometimes people are like, oh, well, that's, you know, that's fairly high. So I think the first thing is sort of setting an expectation for yourself, setting a budget and um, sticking to that, because at the end of the day, you are going to be, um, you know, liable to to make this monthly payment uh, for the next 30 years if you do stay in this specific home uh, for that amount of time in, in terms of your yeah, in terms of your personal financials, uh, what we are going to look at uh, in every lender, frankly, is I always say there's three main categories. Uh, there's credit, credit to me being the top, right? Because if you're not in a position uh, in terms of your credit or your credit history, then at that point you have to to work or get your increase your score or you know erase some some items on your credit in order to be in any position to get a loan to buy a home. Um, so, you know, luckily in today's market, there are a lot of options uh, for, for lower credit scores. You know, let's say credit scores in the, the high 500s or low 600s. Uh, but as you can imagine, uh, credit score is very important in ultimately getting approved for your loan and secondly making sure that you are able to receive the best interest rate and the best monthly payment on your home mm -hmm. uh, so credit is one the second uh the second category or the second uh category looked at is your income and employment so every lender is going to want to confirm that you do have a steady work history now there are there are some um, some things that may come into play. Like for instance, if you are a recent college graduate and you are just entering the workforce, you know whether you be a doctor, an engineer, a nurse, uh, that two you know because typically two years is required in order for you to to qualify. But if you are a new college graduate entering the workforce, now there is an exception to that. Right. They sort of look at your your education as a work history. Um, but, you know, so work history is the second uh, work history and income. So income being do you you know, with your employment, have you had the same income? What has there been any changes? Have you received any increase in your income? If you receive uh, overtime or commission or bonuses, do you have a history of that? Um, and then the third factor is assets. Assets meaning what available funds do you have uh, in order to, to get yourself into that home, right? As a first time home buyer, luckily you have the ability to put as little as 3% down on a conventional loan and 3.5% down on an FHA loan. Uh, so really in terms of, and, and, and another sort of uh, thing to add there is that when it comes to buying a home for you to live in, you can receive a gift uh, for this amount, uh, whether it be from a parent, a relative, a spouse. Uh, so, so those are the three main factors, the credit, your income and employment, and the available assets you have to for, you know, for the purchase. 
Yeah. Awesome. That's amazing. Wow. So, Freddie, how, how does that sound? Does, does it sound like it's, it's challenging for this community? Because so far, um, what he all the things that he said um, are pretty simple and straightforward, but a lot of people mm -hmm. are still scared to take the jump. So, Freddie, what do you think the issue is really here? Okay, so I'll have a follow up question. Um, how do I know how much house I can afford? That's a great question. So, I actually just uh, I got this question today earlier from a client uh, because he was like, hey, you know, my credit score has increased 40 points. Uh, does that mean that I qualify for more? And I said, that's amazing. You know, great. Your, your credit score increased. That's your, you know, you're, you're, you're treading in the right direction. But ultimately what determines what you can qualify for is we do what's called a debt to income uh, calculation, which is we are going to uh, do a monthly calculation of what your income is and compare that to what current debts you have. Current debts being things that are reported on your credit report. So car loans, car leases, student loans, credit cards, personal loans. And based on that, based on those numbers, we are able to determine how much of a potential mortgage payment you could take on uh, based on those numbers, right? So it, it's a great thing because in essence, us, the lender, we are, we are forced to protect you the borrower from going above, you know, a threshold that, you know, you may run, run into some kind of financial trouble. So to answer your question is um, what determines what you qualify for is uh, taking a look at that debt to income ratio. So assuming, you know, the higher the income, the lower the debt, the more that you can potentially qualify in terms of a monthly mortgage payment and ultimately in terms of your purchase power for a home. Does that answer your question, oh. Freddie? Thank you. But I will have like, okay, so is there any rule of thumb, like any formula that I can do on my own before I even talk to a lender to exactly know how much uh, I can qualify for? So Jamil, like, is there a, a, a some form of equation or yeah. uh, a formula, yeah. right, where I can say, okay, I know exactly because the concern that we have in general in this community is that we we don't have a budget. <laughs> so if you right. ask somebody, like, what's 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 your monthly <laughs> expense, right? <laughs> <laughs> the person won't be able to tell you that okay my monthly expense is 1000 in general if you ask them what is your monthly income it's easier to tell you oh yeah i make i make four thousand dollars a month mm -hmm. from my job it's easier for them to tell you okay i make eight thousand dollars a month from my job or i have two jobs and i make sixteen thousand dollars a month from my two jobs. They can easily tell you that. But the part that they don't know is their expenses. So although they're making that, because I have a client right now, she works, she makes about a hundred and uh she, she makes about sixteen thousand dollars a month, but she's mm -hmm. she was she was denied a loan recently, mm -hmm. right? right? Um, and she was shocked because, like, wait, I make a hundred and sixty thousand dollars uh over a hundred and eighty thousand dollars a year. How am I being denied a loan? That was, right. you know, when she was, when she got the breakdown of why she was denied, it started making sense because she has a previous property that did not show on, on her taxes as a rental. So she could not count that as, right. you know, as an income, but it's an expense, right? And then right. she had some other things, a car note and some things like that. And putting that together, she was denied a loan, although she's making $16,000 every month. So it's important that you give people the formula, like, mm -hmm. okay, go sit down, go do your budget. Right. What are your expenses? And, and, and probably tell us specifically, Jamil, what are the expenses that count in your right. calculation? Because yeah. we don't need right. to know your grocery shopping. Maybe you spend $1,000 in the farmer's right. market or the African store. Somebody like me, maybe two thousand a month in just the African supplies, in <laughs> schools and all those kind of stuff. So yeah, but that's right. what, the lender doesn't care about that. So Jamil, can you tell us what are the expenses that the lender cares about, mm -hmm. and then how they can now put that into a formula in order yes. to know here's what I can qualify for, assuming that I have good credit. Right. 
So the great thing is, is that us lenders were able to go based off of your gross uh, monthly income, uh, meaning, you know, the money that you don't see, the money that goes away in taxes or retirement or benefits, we go based off of that gross amount. Uh, now, the rule of thumb is whatever that gross amount is, let's just use 10,000, easy number. If you gross 10,000 monthly, consistently, that's the, month, that's the monthly income that we're able to use uh, to help you qualify. Now, the, the, the number, the, the maximum that your current debts and the current payment that you're going to take on cannot exceed 50, you know, it could go a little bit higher, but let's just say, you know, 50% is the maximum. Meaning if you're grossing 10,000, 5,000 is what we are able to allocate for any current debts, as well as the payment that you are going to potentially take on as a mortgage. Now, in terms of debts, all that we are going to look at is what's reported on your credit report. We don't care about cell phone bills. We oh, don't wow. care about groceries. Because in essence, the reason why we are, we are capped at 50%, let's say, is because we know that you have other expenses in life, right? There's, there's other things that you have to pay for. Um, so the, um, and, and so 50% is the, the, the max, the threshold. And we are going to look at um, the monthly payments for any, any expenses that you have. So if you, you gross 10,000 monthly, 5,000 is the income that we have to play with. Let's say you have a car loan that's 500 a month. Now from that five grand, 5,000, we have to deduct 500. So that's 4,500 we have left. Let's say you have some student loans and the, the monthly payments are $200 a month. Now, again, we subtract the 200. And so as you can see, we're just trying to get to, we're, we start with the gross income, we find the, the maximum in terms of the, the ratio. And then from that ratio, we deduct your current debt and whatever is left over is what we have to play with in terms of a potential monthly payment. Yeah, that's amazing. Thank you so much, yeah. Jamil. I think I have a lot of questions here in the comment section. And yeah. one of them is very interesting. Um, it's Divine. Mm -hmm. I don't know if Divine is in um, Florida or where Divine is right now, but Divine is asking what is considered a, what, what can be considered in terms of employment or a source of income? Is it a full-time job? Um, can part-time job be considered an independent contractor? Um, you know, what are the considerations for these? I know this is going to be a deeper conversation. So it might, we might have to just maybe give just a few, you know, say a few things about that so that we can easily uh, move forward. But what can you say about that in terms of what can be considered? Now we know what is considered in terms of expenses, right? Like um, what they're actually looking for in terms of expenses. Uh, it's what is on your credit report. If something is not on your credit report, they don't care about that. They don't need to know. If you right. if you have child support, but you, it's, a, it's something that you just made an arrangement orally with somebody, you know, that's not appearing anywhere. They're not going to count that as an expense. Uh, but if you have car note on your credit report or you have student loan and that's another one and i would love for you to touch on that as well yeah. when you're done with this question jamil is uh we know that your expenses are what is going to be on your credit report now what about your income and how long are you supposed to have that income before it can be considered right so uh two years is the the magic number uh the underwriter wants to see that and again, there's exceptions to it, right? If you are a fresh college graduate, just work, you know, entering the workforce, uh, at that point, that two year, <clears throat> um, that two year history is no longer needed. Uh, but if you are someone who has been working, you know, maybe you didn't go to school or you just, what they want to see is two years of consistent work history. Okay, now, that Jamil. doesn't mean, yeah. Jamil? Mm -hmm. I'm sorry for interrupting, but just to clarify, mm -hmm. uh, what you mean here is that if somebody just finished medical school, like you're, yes. you you finished medical school, you are now a doctor and you're going to start practicing. You just got your offer letter. 
to work right. in a hospital or you are a, an IT engineer and you just got your offer from Apple or Facebook or Microsoft, all of that. And you have your offer letter, even if you've never worked any day in your life, what you're right. saying is that, you know, that person leaving nursing school and starting a job right now, it's able to just take that letter and yeah. go and apply for a loan. Letter so just, and, and, and to be frank, you, you probably have to collect one paycheck. Maybe just one. So you mean, you know, work two weeks at the job. Yes. yes. Uh, so yeah, so that is one of the, you know, one of the exceptions uh, to that, to that rule. But, every, you know, besides that, you know, two years consistent work history is required. That doesn't mean you have to be with the same employer for the same, you know, for the past two years, right? You could have gone from Apple to Facebook to, you know, another company. But as long as you can, you know, there, there aren't big gaps in your employment w within those transitions or changes, yeah. uh, you know, that, that is perfectly fine. Okay, and, but Jamil, though, yeah. if, I mean, we just had Elvis, and I'm sorry to interrupt, Elvis just asked, so if you have, if you work on short-term contract, like six months, when he says contract, it doesn't mean that you are, that is, a, that is um, 1099 or whatever. It's just that it's really, it can be a W-2 or all that, but it's actually very short depending on the type of work. Like, for example, if yeah. you are a scrum right. master and you're hired to work as a scrum master on the project, or even if you are a nurse and you're a travel nurse, chances are that you don't stay in one place for long. So would you guys, even though it's going to be multiple companies, but it's consistent, mm -hmm. And it's the same field. Would that be okay? Absolutely, that is fine. Um, you know, at, at the end of the day, you're still a paycheck W two employee. You know, at that point, there'd be sort of um, further calculations. You know, if there was variations in your income between different jobs, at that point, you know, they would they would sort of average it out over the past two years. Now, one thing that I should mention is. Let's say you are, you know, a W-2 employee for six months or let's say a year, and then you decide to start your own business. Uh, at that point, you are changing the type of uh, income you are receiving. And so at that point, the, the, the year of W-2 employment doesn't count, right? Because you are changing your type of employment. So it's really the type of income that you receive. You have to have a two-year history of it. So if you're self-employed, you need a two-year history, self-employment. If you're W-2, you need a two-year history W-2. Again, exceptions if you are just entering the workforce as a college graduate. Okay. Um, so, so two years is the rule of thumb okay. for employment. Thank you so much, Jamil. I, sure. I want to I want to stay in that. It's very interesting. And we have a lot of questions about that. And one of them is, um, you know, can a an LLC or business be considered a first time home buyer? Um, given that, you know, that business is probably purchasing a property for the first time. So mm -hmm. would they count that? Because I, I just want to go back to what you just explained. And I want to specify that this is just for going co the conventional route, right? right? Because right. we're going to talk if in a few minutes, we're going to talk about possibilities of doing all kinds of financing, you know, right. that are exotic kind of, you know, creative financing. And at that point, it the rules are completely different, right? So, but, you know, I just want to clarify that everything that Jamil is saying right now is based on the assumption that you're going the conventional route. When I say, or traditional, you're going to the traditional Correct. route. Meaning that you're getting um, probably a USDA loan or a VA loan or a an FHA loan or um, a conventional loan, right, Jamil? Right, absolutely. Yeah, correct. So okay. these are sort of the uh, you know the guidelines for your traditional mortgages, like you said, the conventional USDA, VA, uh, FHA, uh, which these types are loan. These types of loans are meant for individuals as opposed okay. to LLCs. So the thought behind this is, you know, this is a, a single, you know, a person, an individual or a couple buying a home um, as opposed to, you know, uh, an LLC, which, like you said, this is a little bit different type of financing. Uh, there's there's um, a whole catalog of different types of loans for 
you know, for investors or uh, LLCs trying to purchase properties. But, okay. uh, but yeah, but these guidelines are, are for, you know, um, for individuals or cu couples who are trying to purchase a home. Okay, that's that's very. It's good to clarify that. And um, I, we have another question here that I'm going to give you the opportunity to come back on. But Freddie, let me, uh, let me just ask you this again: um, Have you had experience making a purchase, like purchasing real estate, um, with your LLC, or has it always been for all your properties? Has it always been as an as an individual? Wow, well, we have two in LLCs. Sorry, Freddie, I couldn't hear you. Sorry. I say, yeah, we purchased two with LLC. Oh, two. Okay. Okay, good. Yeah. So we're going to get back to you to see how you finance those properties um, as an LLC. So this is really great that we have that. But Jamil, coming back to you now, though, um, there was this question about um, can an LLC be considered a first time home buyer not not for fha because we know that fha is for individuals and it's Correct. for primary residents you cannot Correct. get an fha to go buy a a uh, an investment property but can you mm -hmm. be considered a first time home buyer with an llc uh, are there any perks for that unfortunately not because for first time home buyers uh, these types of programs have to be uh, the ownership of the home has to be under an individual's name as opposed to an entity or an LLC. Yeah. Uh, so these, you know, these low down payment options, uh, these are meant for, again, individuals or couples, families buying a home, as opposed to, you know, uh, an LLC or an investor. Okay. Awesome. Got it. I think, I think that answers your question. Um, Divine, it was probably your questions, but, but you also asked, uh, what about um, part-time and 1099? But I believe that Jamil has already clarified that by saying uh, for mm -hmm. LLCs and, uh, you know, for staying the regular or traditional or conventional, you have to have that two year um, history. So if, right. even if so, Jamil, even if you're doing part time, but you have a two year history of your part time job, as long as you, that gives you enough funds. Right. To be mm -hmm. to able to, to be able to qualify, mm -hmm. that will still be fine. Even if it's 1099, that means you're self-employed. As long as you have two years, it's fine. Right. Correct. Uh, another thing to mention uh, is, let's say you work two jobs. You you still have to, you have to have a two year history of working two jobs in order mm -hmm. to in order for us to use income for both jobs. Right. The underwriter wants to underwriter being the the person who's going to review your file and ultimately make a decision on the approval or denial. They want to they want to ensure that you have a two year history of working two jobs. Okay. Right. So let's say you have a full time job and you just started a part time job six months ago. Unfortunately, you know, we, we are only able to use income from the full time job until you have a two year history working both jobs. Okay, got it. That that makes sense. Uh, but in the meantime, they can qualify based on the one job that we have for over. Correct. Okay, that's awesome. I, I want to stay in this and probably ask you um, the last question um, here concerning, um, you, you know, making, um, uh, you know, making the purchase as a primary residence, right. you know, versus investment. You know, how is that? How is that transition? So what I'm trying to uh, what, what I'm trying to ask you is, can you purchase a property as a primary residence mm -hmm. with the intention of turning that property into an investment property down the road? I'm asking that because a lot of people yeah. have used the strategy of staying in a house as an FHA for some time and then build more properties that way. Because keep in mind, the goal of this live today, this live stream today is to help you build a real estate empire. We're not trying to make you just go buy your one property. You can always go, you know, figure out how to buy just one property. We want you to buy the first property. Absolutely. But we want to keep in mind that the goal is for you to build a portfolio of multiple properties. So how do you go about that, Jamil, to be compliant? Sure. Yeah, so there's there's plenty of times where a client will, you know, buy a home. It's, you know, like a starter home and then their family will grow and then they're like, hey, you know, I need to I need to uh, upgrade. I need some more space. Uh, but, you know, I don't want to lose my house here. Do I have any options uh, with that? So the answer is yes. You always have the option to 
convert uh, the home that you are currently living in to a rental home and then buy another home again while maintaining the home that you were living in uh, or currently living in. At that point, you know, because obviously if, if you have a, a mortgage on the home that you're currently living in and you're trying to take on a new mortgage, now we have two loans uh, that we have to take into account with the whole debt to income ratio. And as you can imagine, that'll, that'll greatly affect how much you can uh, qualify for, right? So if I own a home now and I want to hold on to it and I have a mortgage, it's going to, it's going to weigh down my debt to income ratio. But the great thing is, is that what you can do is provide a lease agreement for the home that you are vacating. And now we, as a lender, we are able to use the, the lease agreement income, 75% of that amount to help offset the debt, right? So if you, let's say you, you currently live in a home, the mortgage payment is $1,000. You are now looking at a home that, you know, it, it's an upgrade. The mortgage payment is $2,000. Um, what we can do is, and what I would advise you to do is, Okay, well, get a lease agreement together for the home that you plan on vacating. Okay. Um, and again, the, the whatever the lease agreement, the amount you're receiving monthly, we are able to use up to 75% of that amount to help offset that debt. Um, Jamie, I'm going to ask you a question here. I'm going to sure. put you on the, I'm going to put you on the hot seat. Sure. <laughs> Don't hit <laughs> me for it, but I, I'm going to ask, right? Um, Freddie, back me here. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm, I, I'm asking for a friend and for my community because I love my community. Jamil, did, do you guys ever, I mean, and I don't want you to lose your license. Just be truthful with me. Do you guys <laughs> ever go and verify the lease agreement? <laughs> No, I'm sorry, I, I don't intend don't. to do anything. Well, the, but I'm just yeah, the most that they'll probably ask for is uh, the security deposit proof that the security deposit and first month's rent was paid. Oh, now they may ask, or do they, they always may, ask? They, they may ask, okay. they do, and, and this is one of those like underwriter to underwriter who you know, like how, how particular are they? Yeah, uh, but that's the most that they'll they'll you know they'll ask yeah. for is mm -hmm. proof of security. Of course, they want to see a lease agreement. They want to yeah. see a physical agreement signed by you, the landlord, and the tenant, okay. um, and showing how much you're going to receive. How you know when is it going to be paid? And then uh, they they want to see. Sometimes they would like to see the security deposit and first month's rent deposited yeah. into your account. Thank you so much, Jamil. I mean, I, I love your answer. And I think you did also like your, like your answer because what that means is, you know, we are in a country where everybody is being smart. We are, we, you just have to, yeah, you just have to follow the law while being smart. So yeah, if you can show, you just, I mean, there are people that are not very lucky. And so if you're that kind of person that's not usually very lucky and you come up with a lease agreement when it cannot be verified, you can find yourself in trouble if you can't really show a deposit that was made for the security deposit or for the, for the, uh, or for the first month rent. Even if it was cash, you should be at least be, you should be able to show, you know, a deposit in your account. That yeah. would correspond to that. So, guys, whatever you're doing out there, and I'm not saying you to go do anything, but just make sure that you have everything to back. Whatever you're telling the lender, you don't want to be, if there's one thing you don't ever want to be, uh, you know, indicted for, or considered for, is mortgage fraud. That, I know, it's can the ramifications can be very, very disastrous, and we don't want you to be in that situation. So, thank you for uh, thank taking you. my hot question, Jamil. I, I appreciate that. And I'd be dishonest if I, if I told you that there, there hasn't been times where I tell my clients like, Hey, just, just get a lease agreement together with a family member. Because, you know, sometimes like you're not at that point in the, in the transition, you're not worried about getting a tenant into the home that you're trying to leave. Yeah. You're just worried about buying a new home. And then, you know, in a month or two, I'll rent it out. So what I tell clients is, um, Whatever works. you know, just put a lease agreement together with a close yeah. friend or family. You know, yeah. you may have to move some money to your account. At the end of the day, it's 
you know, like you whatever said, whatever can it's be proved, whatever yeah. can be proved is what matters. And my mom can be my tenant, whatever yeah. works. And, 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 and the underwriter can't can't deny that, right? No. You know, there's plenty no. of times where you'll rent a house to your family member and and uh, and so forth. So okay, got yeah. it. Thank you Thank so you. much. And so, uh, Fendi, yeah. I wanted to ask you a question about how you can turn your invest. I mean, your primary residence into an income generating you know i'm a cash flow queen and i always want to see how even if that house is a, is my primary residence how can i make money out of it so i'm going to ask you that question freddie because i know that you are the short-term rental king and you know what can i do in terms of what we call in real estate house hacking what can i do that can help me um you know uh, generate cash flow while i live in a house just to pick back off of what you just said, um, I have a question for Jamil first. Because he said something, I just don't want to forget. He said something mm -hmm. about um, when you are moving from an FHA, so your first um, first time home by a loan, and you put that residence for rent. So my question is, because you talk about upgrade. So if I buy as a first time home, first time residence, a three, two, so three bed, two baths. And then after a year living in that property, I want to rent it out and go do the same thing. Do I necessarily buy something bigger or even the three, two, my still work. And that's when you're staying FHA. I just want to make sure I understand. Freddie, are we staying yes. FHA here for the second property? Yes. But Jamil, I yeah, go mm -hmm. ahead. But I I, yes. I don't know. Is it possible to have two FHAs first? So yes. there is technically it, it's rather difficult. Uh in order for you to have two simultaneous FHA loans out, they want the second home to be if I if I remember correctly, at least a hundred miles away from where your existing FHA loan is. Now, what I always like to remind people is that FHA is, people think first time home buyer FHA, like automatically off the bat, but conventional has the, the same perks. You can do as little as 3% down. If you have credit, conventional is gonna give you uh, better, you know, better uh, monthly mortgage insurance, better interest rates. So, if you currently, you know, to answer your question, if you currently have an FHA loan and you're looking to buy a home within the same town, mm -hmm. chances are you can't get another FHA loan on that house, on the next house. But there is always the option of getting a conventional loan and even and doing even less money down, right? Because the minimum down payment for FHA is three and a half percent. And uh, the minimum down payment for conventional is three percent. And that's regardless of whether you're a first time home buyer or not. Oh, you can be cool. a second or third or fourth time. Box? Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's uh, you know, the perks of being a first time home buyer with conventional is you're going to get a discount on the monthly mortgage insurance and you're going to get a discount on the interest rate. But if I buy my second home with the conventional three, I still have the option of doing 3% down. I just won't have the discounted mortgage insurance and, and interest rate. Right. But so, the 3% options still something there. something new today, Freddie. Yeah, so you are telling me that even if I have my FHA right now and uh, next week I want to purchase another property, I can be conventional with 3%. It's not, it's not considered as an uh, investment? Well, it would, it would have to make sense. Right. So the underwriter, because that's that's a great you're thinking in the right direction. The underwriter is always going to want to confirm like, OK, so you just bought this house four months ago. Now, you know, it's a five hundred thousand dollar house, four bedroom, two bath. And now you're trying to buy a condo that's only two beds and one bath and you're claiming it's a primary and it's in the same town. The underwriter will definitely question that. Yeah. Now, is there a way to potentially explain it? Possibly, you know, I'm going through a divorce. I'm downsizing. 
you know, things have happened in my family. Um, so yes, it's, it is one of those, it is challenging, but there is ways to sort of explain the situation um, if it makes sense. But so have the right way that you can do it backwards. So if my family was a three, two, and I want to buy within the same um, city or the same town a five bedroom, I can have a three percent and yeah. not consider it as an investment. Correct, because at that point the underwriter, you know, it's it, it makes sense. It's like it's an upgrade, right? Mm. Now, now, regardless, if you do think if you buy a primary home and then you decide to buy another primary home let's say with less that less than six months apart, it's still gonna, our questions are still gonna come up, right? Because it's like, okay, you just bought a home, now you're trying to buy another home. But if the the new home that you're buying is an upgrade, it just makes things a lot easier. Okay, Jamil, I have a, I, okay, so just to clarify here, there will be no questions asked or no concerns raised if I, I have occupied the first property for, a year or more yeah so uh yeah technically six months they you they you, when you sign your uh at closing you sign a disclosure that says that you intend to occupy the property for at least, at least six months okay but the more time the better but six months mm -hmm. is the bare minimum okay that, that sounds good i think that clarifies uh that concern and we could probably move forward with you freddie if you want to uh, give yeah. us some options here. You want to start making money with that first property, you know, before you even consider waiting for the six months to get your next property. In fact, what what should you be thinking of, Freddie, when you're trying to buy a house as somebody who is educated and who's trying to build an empire in real estate? What are you looking at when you're buying the house? Because you're not buying a house now like a normal person who just want to buy a house and just go live in the house. You're thinking like, I'm buying this house, but it's just my first step towards buying more houses. So, Freddie, how, how do you go about that to start generating income? Okay, just uh, to answer the question you um, previously asked, there's uh, multiple ways that you can do that. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't personally do it, but a lot of people will buy a three-bedroom and then they're going to Airbnb two of the bedrooms and live in one. So Airbnb has been proven to be like really, because when you do long term, um, you can still make money, but with Airbnb, if your location is right, you can actually use one room in your house to pay your whole mortgage. Mm. So it just depends on the, the case to case basis. And before I even go to that, there's uh, like house hack when uh, you can buy a duplex, but those are really rare now. Like, looks like everybody in the United States know already about house hacking. So duplexes, as the real estate, you know, like they don't stay on the market for two days because oh everybody know and uh, at that point, a lot of people just switch to like rooming. They purchase their home in a great place, maybe with stadiums or like a place where something going on right. and they rent by room like at the Airbnb and those rooms pay their mortgage and they can move out and purchase another property. Okay, that's amazing. Actually, uh, I, I like how you, you know, you gave multiple options here. So for somebody who's buying a house, as you're picking the right house for you, you're going to look for something if you're single. And I speak to a lot of buyers who are single, they're like 24, 25, they're starting their career, you know, making good money, six figure, no wife, no children. And I'm telling them, if you're willing to share your space with other people, you're going to start making cash flow in that house. A lot of them are very uncomfortable because, que, you know, je suis un grand monsieur, I'm making six figure. I don't want to share my space with people. What are you talking about, uh, Lisa? I don't want that. I want to have my own space. Good for you. We don't have the same problems. We don't come from the same place. I come from a place where 
I had to sleep on the same bed with all my three children. So we were four of us in one room and we had a three bedroom, uh, three bath, uh, actually four bedroom, three bath, and all the other rooms were rented. That's the only way that we could survive for a couple of mm -hmm. years as a family. Um, and so I, I just made sure that I was picking the right tenants, right? That, you know, I was doing the background check, making sure that those are not people that would endanger my family and things like that. But sometimes you have to do what you have to do if you want to reach a certain level. But now if you just want to live in a mansion, like a, you know, a big boss and you don't want people around you, maybe you don't want cash flow either. But the, the, the advice that Freddie just gave is for somebody who's willing to sacrifice their privacy and you know have some cash flow for the beginning of their portfolio that they're building and one last thing i want to add to that freddie before we move on is that even if you don't have the duplexes anymore um depending on where you live if you're in texas you're probably not going to have this option but if you're in maryland or in in regions where you have a basement a lot of people actually are house hacking their basement and still having that privacy one of my clients actually bought a house with three bedrooms in the upper level and two be two bedroom, one bath in the basement. And the basement has private entrance and a pool mm -hmm. and everything. So the, the 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 tenant in her basement does not even access the, the basement through her house. She goes around and has the private entrance, and and that's that just gives her the privacy with her children and her husband. So, if you're thinking like Freddie is saying, you want to see when you're looking at that house, would I be able to find a way to have people here generate cash flow while I'm here, and then after six months, like Jamil said, or after a year, I can now move on to you know another property. And so Freddie, that's um, and Jamil, that's going to take us to the investment. Uh, properties and I know there's a difference between you know buying those investment properties and buying just a regular residence because when you buy the first one FHA or not you know three percent conventional or whatever you get the second one there's only so many that you can get with a three percent three point five percent at one point you're gonna have to really you know go as an investor and buy this property as an investor and, right. and general, how do you approach that you know when people come to you the ideal applicant what what do you how, how does that look like how does that file looks and what kind of advice you have for them yeah so the parameters are more or less the same you know we're gonna we're gonna make sure that your credit is um at a, at a place where we can get you a loan and get you some great programs and, and offers. Um, in terms of, now the great thing about buying an investment property is unlike a primary home, uh, with the investment property, we're able to take into account the potential rental income you are going to receive to help you qualify for the home. Right. So let's say uh, you find a, a condo and the monthly payment for the the monthly payment for the condo is fifteen hundred dollars a month. And we and based on our analysis with the appraisal, we determined that the rental income for this condo is going to be eighteen hundred dollars a month. Well, then you're practically you know, it's a wash, although you have a mortgage payment of fifteen hundred. The appraisal report is showing that the 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 potential income that you're going to generate from this home is greater than the monthly expense so that's one of the great factors you know people think that buying an investment property can be tough but really it's the same parameters you know as long as you have a two-year work history as long as you have uh good or great credit uh the, the property itself is going to help you qualify based on the potential rental income Oh, wow. Now, the, 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 the part of it that can be sort of challenging is the amount of money that you're going to need to get into the investment home. You know, unlike uh, a primary home where, again, you can do as little as three or three and a half percent down. Uh, with an investment home, the minimum down payment is 20 percent down. Uh, and that, that minimum will increase if the property is a duplex or three family or four family, it can potentially go up to 25 or 30% down. And in addition to that, the underwriter is going to verify 
that you have reserves as well. So reserves meaning uh, they want to make sure that you have six to 12 months of your mortgage payment in the bank after the 20% down and the closing costs. So unlike a primary home, again, where you can do a little down, they're not really going to check for reserves unless your credit score is a little bit lower and maybe they need to verify that you have uh, two or four months of your mortgage payment in the bank, uh, investment properties are going to require more money down. And as well, they're going to verify that you have reserves in the bank. Thank you, Jamil. I actually, um, I, I'm glad you just mentioned the reserve part. A lot of people miss that part. It's important yeah. to think about your down payment, your closing costs, but also your reserves. And you just mentioned that including for, for, for primary yeah. residences too? So for primary, it depends. If you have lower credit score, mm -hmm. they may require it, right? Like if your credit is like a 570 or 580, they may say, okay, well, you know, we can get you approved, but you have to, there's what's called compensating factors. So they, one of the compensating okay. factors mm -hmm. is, okay, you know, your credit score is a little lower, but if you have $100,000 in the bank, then that kind of eases the, 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 the risk assessment okay. at that point. And another thing that I, I should have, um, I should clarify is these reserves, it doesn't have to be money in the bank. It can be investment accounts. It can be a 401k. It can be a retirement account. It can be stocks. Uh, it just has to be some sort of asset, uh, you know, available to you. Right. That's amazing. I'm glad you clarified that because a lot of people would think that reserve means you have to have that extra cash in your bank account. But the, so, but if you have money in your 401k, if you have, uh, you know, money in your stock market account, right. That would right. come. Um, and so your retirement account, all of that. So that, that's amazing that you just mentioned that. Uh, but I wanted to ask you a question, uh, Jamil, and somebody actually just asked that question here is that um, if you have, uh, what are the requirements? If you now decide that you want to refinance um, that conventional loan, would they still require a two years uh, work history? So, so like, do you mm -hmm. have the same requirement for refinancing as you have for purchases? Correct, yeah. So, mm -hmm. you know, even like, let's say you've been in the, the house for two years and uh, like, your employment changed or you lost your job and you continue to make the payment. Not unfortunately, but you know, you still have to have a two year work history, even to refinance, to take on a new loan. You have to prove that you have the ability to repay uh, based on your employment, based on your income. So yeah, same, same parameters for purchase or refinance. You have to have a two year history. Okay. And so, but again, that is when we remain in the traditional financing, because we're going to get right. into, you know, more creative financing shortly. But before we get to that, someone was asking if you can say something about assumable loans, assumable mortgages, um, you know, how does that work um, in general? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, truthfully, I've I've never ran across it, but I know that you know with FHA and VA, there are uh, the ability to essentially assume, uh, you know, to take on the existing mortgage rate nice. and mm -hmm. payment of the the person who's selling the home. Yeah. Um, you know, as far as uh, details, I, I would have to sort of uh, do a little research on that just to. Yeah see what the parameters are, but, but yeah, there are, there are options for that. Conventional doesn't have that. This is just a government, uh, Backed loans. government loans. Yeah. So yeah. VA, uh, and, and FHA. I actually run across one of those recently. Um, and it was a little bit tough because the, the seller had a balance of $350,000 and was selling the property for four hundred. dollars and 99,000, so almost 500,000. And okay. so in that, at that time, uh, the market was at 7.5% interest rate, mm. but their loan was at 3.5%. Yeah. So technically I mm. was trying to work with my client to see if the client could come up with the extra, uh, I think it was going to be 150,000. 
thousand or something like that. My client got close because the bank wanted to accept the assumption of of mortgage under the condition that they would take the three hundred and fifty thousand dollars balance, but they would pay right. the remaining the balance difference. in cash. So they right. wanted to <laughs> see that because you know, and so for those who are out there. Um, and we're going to talk about this when we talk about all the uh, creative ways of getting loans or uh, out there or getting properties out there, the seller could accept, right, Freddie, to sell or finance mm -hmm. the portion that they were supposed to make at closing. They were supposed to get a check for that 150000 So if they want it, they could have given that second portion as a seller a loan as a seller finance option if the person qualifies to take that much in debt if they could qualify to take that much in 500,000 that could have been an option but this bank did not even want that that bank wanted to see cash um mm. but you know just to let you guys know that, that that option is possible if you find someone who is giving you an option for an assumable loan you can discuss to see if their bank would allow you to have a second or a separate negotiation with the seller to get a seller finance amount on the side with a different interest rate, different money payment. You will just have two payments to make on the house per month, but you're going to enjoy the 3.5% unbeatable right. rate, right? So yeah, that's definitely something that you guys can explore. And um, Jamil, with your permission, we're going to move on to, um, you know, something more fun. Guys, so I, know, I hope you've been sharing I know it's Can I ask a quick question to the mail. Go, sure. go ahead. Yeah, but in the meantime, okay. you guys share, share, share as much as you can. Go ahead, Freddie. We were talking about um, the refinancing, right? And then you said that you guys still check the two years of uh, employment. So, for instance, like last year, you made what, like fifty thousand. And this year, you are making hundred. Are you going to assume um, seventy-five thousand income, or the hundred thousand, the hundred thousand that you start making this year? So it's um, if it's a salary, like if let's say your salary just increased to the hundred thousand. At that point, we are going based on that number. That is the number you are earning. You know, it, it's, um, it's, you know, oftentimes people get raises and uh, we're, we're always able to go off of your current amount. Uh, okay. Even if you don't have a history at that amount, you know, it's, it's, it's perfectly fine. Now, if, if it's more of a variable income, meaning, you know, let's say you earn commission or you uh, receive bonuses or overtime and, you know, with, with what we call variable income, we are always going to do a two year history look back and either average it or go based on a lower amount. So two two scenarios here, let's say in, you know, you earn commission and in 2021, you made $50,000 worth of commission. And in 2022, you made $100,000 worth of commission. So it's trending upward. So at that point, we're able to average the two years, bringing us at 75. Scenario two is, you know, the vice versa. Let's say you made more, you made 100,000 in 2021, but then 50,000 in 2022. Now at that point, since it's trending downwards, we have to go based on the worst case scenario, which was your last year's earnings of 50,000. How about your business? So business, uh, same thing. We're, we're always going to, if you've been in business for five years, there is the possibility of only looking at your previous year tax return. But if you've been in business for less than five years, you always have to do a two year look back. Mm -hmm. And, um, and we're always, you know, every lender is always going to go based on your net income after any, you know, business expenses, any write offs. I'm sorry, Jamil. I'm speaking in French here. <laughs> okay. Because the net income part is what kills us. Most of yeah, us, that, we all make ten thousand dollars a year in terms. Yeah, of but, but it's but know. it's great because you know there are a lot of programs out there uh, which we're sort of getting to that, uh, especially for self-employed clients, that 
will will take into account other documentation to help determine income, right? So instead of looking at tax returns, maybe we look at your business bank statements for the past 12 months or 24 months mm -hmm. and average what your deposits are for those for those amount of months. And that's it? Other than, you know, they call it a bank statement loan, but exactly. other than the bank statement, you don't ask for the tax return, nothing. No, we don't want to look at it. We don't want to see the tax returns. We're doing a bank statement loan. It's 12 months, you know, either 12 or 24 months, uh, again, de depending on how long you've been in business. Um, and there's also even profit and loss statements. So if you're able to get a profit and loss statement from a CPA, uh, you know, again, we could do a one or two year profit, profit and loss. Uh, statement and essentially determine your income based on that. Mind you, you know, interest rates are slightly higher for loans like it this is. compared yeah. to your conventional mm -hmm. loan, but, you know, it, it still gives you the option, still gives you the ability to get into a home as opposed to not having an option oh, yeah, at absolutely. all. And absolutely. then, at, you know, and then at the end of the day, let's say in a year or two, maybe your tax returns, your net income on your tax returns does present a better number now you could always refinance uh into a conventional loan that's amazing freddie you have experience with that right the bank statement loan a lot tell of us about that yes a lot of <laughs> please take one minute just one minute to you know encourage somebody out there tell us a little bit about that in one minute please yeah that's the type of loan i had on my uh, primary residence actually um it wasn't fun, but um, at the end of the day, you want to get something and just you just do what you have to do. As he said, the interest rate is a little bit higher, and then the down payment too will be higher than uh, even if it's your first residence. We Correct. pay thirty percent down. So. Oh, you pay thirty percent. Yeah, <laughs> but so. you could afford that, though. You could afford that as a business yeah. owner. That's a good thing. That's the thing. No, but I believe that at the time, what you wanted was a house, a beautiful house for you and your family. But because you were at the time, I think is that when you were, you started flipping cars, or at the time you already had like two yeah. business running, two businesses so. running. At that time, here was my situation. So I started the business in 2019, yeah. reported uh, 10,000 <laughs> income. All of us. <laughs> and then the second year, um, since we got kicked out of the house in February, we just filed that year, like normally we filed, I think I filed about 76,000. And, uh, they couldn't accept that because it was for that year. Mm. So they went with the bank statements. And that's that's the point. So the lender used my wife's credit and my income to qualify for it. Oh on wow. that is one. that possible, Jamil? That yeah, possible? there's yeah, there's there's plenty of um you know lenders, banks that will have different ways to approach it and have different options. And I think another sort of thing to mention here is, yeah, it's, it's a slightly higher rate, slightly down, higher down payment, but just think about what it would take for you to have to pay in taxes to show that income to get you into the home conventionally. So exactly. you know, it's, it's, it's almost that's like, you know, pick, yeah. pick and choose. What, what, yeah, what would you rather yeah, that's pay right. the money in taxes or pay it towards your equity in your home and take on a slightly higher rate? So. That, that's so, powerful what you just point. said, Jamil. That's a point. And, and tell us a little bit about that, Freddie, because the 30% was going towards the your, your, your the down payment of your mm -hmm. house. So that means the same house, you now have more equity on the house. Exactly. And also, what was your interest rate? Because that was a while ago. And maybe let me compare that with what the interest rates are now. When, when people were paying like 3% and 2%, ours was like 575 and do you know that the fast seventy five that you have right now is what my my buyers with the best credit right. score seven eighty? That's what they're getting right. right now. And right now, I can't even like because the house, the appreciation on the house yeah. is I think when like one hundred and eighty thousand dollars, and that's in only on the So it's I have no regret, but right now we have so much money in that time that 
I need to catch that. So yeah, yeah, please. We do. are finding a way to get that money out. Mm -hmm. That's amazing, Jamil. I like how you said that you want to start there if you can, and if your funds can allow you, or if your tax returns can allow you in the coming years to get a better deal, you can always refinance out of that deal. If you feel like the interest rate was a little bit punitive, or was too much, and then the interest rates happen to go down, you can, you, if, and you have income to show. Like some people have businesses, but then they go back in, you know, and, and get a job, right? You, you never know. So if right. you're in a situation where you can go back and have a job that can show enough income for, you know, your next purchase or, you know, for you to refinance what you currently have, you can do that down the road after two years in that job. So that's right. also an option, but keep in mind, and, and that's very important when you mentioned, Jamil, that how much you're going to pay in taxes, because when you make a hundred thousand dollars in net income or gross, whatever they call it, income, gro gross something income, <laughs> whatever they call it. If you have a hundred thousand, you now have to pay taxes around about fifteen thousand, depending right. on your situation. Yeah. So now do you really want to pay fifteen thousand dollars in taxes just because you want to be able to have the tax return to show to have a property, or do you want to go with your business and get, uh, you know, two percent higher interest rate right. compared to other people and keep your fifteen thousand in your pocket? You just have to like do the math and see the what is the exactly. best option for you, right? But unless you have those different options, so thank you so much for giving, um, you know, giving us that that option too. But before we forget, just... Jamil, I mean, uh, Freddie, if you will allow yeah. me, before we forget. There's one thing that I wanted you to talk about today. You know, even if somebody leaves now, they have to at least take advantage of this. You discussed with me recently that there is an opportunity now whereby you can get a 2.5, a 2 to 3.5% in, um, in, in, in um, grant or closing right. cost help from your lender. Um, and that is zero refund uh, uh, repayment required like that's right. free money can you please Correct. tell us about that i'm very curious about that like give us the details on that who can qualify you know mm -hmm. what is needed for that just let us know and please guys take notes and make sure that you reach out to jamil at the end of this i'm going to put his contact information in the chat thank you for that yeah so like you said we we um and this is a an fha program so this is um, FHA financing. It's not one of those, you know, out of the box loans that we were discussing. Uh, this is an FHA loan uh, where you have the the possibility of getting uh, uh, a gift from the lender directly from us of up to three and a half percent. It could be two percent, but up to three and a half percent to completely cover your down payment. Um, and, and so, you know, it completely changes the game, you know, right now there's a lot of first time home buyers who maybe, you know, they're, they, they don't feel like they have enough money to get into a home or, or even if you do have funds and you wanted to just take advantage of this program, um, you know, this program is, is, is incredible. And there's no, there's no sort of additional requirements, uh, to it, uh, besides, whatever the FHA standard guidelines are, right? So you have to have, um, you know, credit uh, for this program, you have to have at least a, a, a 580 credit, um, you know, and uh, have two years of employment, uh, depending on what your debt to income ratio is will determine how much you qualify for in terms of a purchase price and, and monthly payment. Um, and um, yeah, that's, it's, it's incredible. Wow. It's, it's great. Um, and you know, one thing you'll know, you'll you'll find out about me if you ever work with me is that I'm fully transparent. I, I have nothing to hide, or you know, at the end of the day, I'm, my incentive is to put you in the best program. I have no other incentive. And with these programs, the interest rates again are slightly higher than your traditional FHA loan. If you were to put your own three and a half percent down, but still, again, it gives you an opportunity to get into the home. Um, and, and at the end of the day, if you're renting, what you're, you're losing money, right? You're, you're not, you're not building any equity in that, 
you're paying a zero percent interest rate towards yourself. So it's it's um it's a great program, and um yeah. you know I'm just I'm I'm grateful to to have that in my in my repertoire of, of programs yeah. and products. That's amazing, yeah. Jamil. You know I I I'm glad you mentioned how how open and you know transparent you are and that's the reason why i love working with you in fact i think all my properties are with you um but you know um one thing that i know about you and sometimes i wonder but i'm also a little bit like you so i i i'm not surprised that somebody would think that way i know there are so many instances where you told my clients go and take three six months right go and mm -hmm. work on this work on this work on that and come back so that you can right. have, you know, better options if you have that possibility. But if somebody's in a situation where they absolutely have to get a house, well, right. get, you know, get a house, right? Yeah. You can always get better terms down the road. But if you have the opportunity to be patient and wait a little bit and get better terms, you go for that. And so rarely have I seen lenders or even realtors that would tell you, take your time and come back they want to put you into anything because keep in mind i discovered recently that even with a 500 credit score you can be qualified to purchase a house it's just that right. your interest rate is going to be high like jamil just said but even if your credit score is 500 you can still buy a house so the question right. now should be when you started uh, tonight if you said something jamil you said if you want to buy a house your first question should be how much house can i afford like mm -hmm. based on my monthly income, how much money can I put towards paying a house? So even if your credit score is 500, but you do the math and with the interest rate you're going to get and the house you're getting, you're still going to find yourself paying less than what you would have paid renting. Go for it. And Absolutely. then walk in your credit and then, you know, refinance that loan down the road. But I just wanted to highlight the fact that you don't take advantage of people and their situation, you always give them the option to go and work on their file and come back. And then uh, one last thing that I want to say about this is the down payment, What you just explained up to 3.5%. If I'm buying a $300,000 house, it's going to be about 10,500 free money, 10,500 free money that the lender is going to give me right towards uh, my FHA loan and uh, the interest rate might be a little bit different. But what that means is that if I'm renting right now, right, Freddie, I can continue to rent because I don't have any money saved. And every time that coach Lisa is saying, guys, buy a house, invest in real estate, you say, I don't have money. I don't know what she's talking about. I don't have any savings. This is 10,500 free money. That you're already getting and and this is enough to be to be um to be the down payment for a three hundred thousand dollars house on an fha loan all you're gonna need is probably your closing cost and jamil please don't go without talking about gifts you can get a yeah. gift right, from family members you can get a gift correct as long as um the property is a primary home meaning you're buying to live in it there's no issues, uh, whether we go conventional FHA, there's no issues with you receiving a gift uh, from, it has to be a family member. Uh, so, you know, obviously parents, uh, siblings, uh, spouse, um, but yeah, that there's no issues with that. And um, Prudence, as you know, there's, there's also the option of getting, you know, it's kind of tough in today's market, but getting like a seller's credit or concession as well, which I know yeah. you you always fight, you know, for your clients and I and always back. fight for that to yeah. get the sellers, uh, the sellers right. closing cost assistance. Uh, but some of my clients even beat me to that. One of them went beyond what I ask and got even more. She's she's on this call today. I'm always looking at her like, oh my goodness, I thought I was a tough negotiator, but this one. <laughs> She's a first time home buyer and you know who I'm talking about, but um, she was able to get even more money from this. Yeah. Seller. So yeah, there are many ways that you can get money out there um, yeah. as long as there's not a limit to it. And um, you know, I think we have limits when it comes to, when it comes to um, investment properties, right? Correct. Like the maximum, what, what yeah. there's the maximum investment, yeah. but what's the maximum on the primary or the FHA? 
Yeah, so just to uh, go back on the gifts. So if you're buying an investment home, you can't receive gifts. Every All the money that you that is required, again, for the down payment, the closing costs and reserves has to be something that you possess, you know, in, within your account. Um, in terms of seller uh, credits or, you know, sellers helping with paying your closing costs, um, conventional has uh, different amounts based on the down payment that you provide. So if you provide 10% or less, you can get a seller's credit back to you at closing of up to 3% of the purchase price. Mm. If you do um, a down payment of between 10% and 25%, it goes up to 6% mm -hmm. sellers uh, of the sale price. And anything over 25% is a 9% wow. credit back from the closing. So. The higher the down payment, the more potential uh, credit back you can receive from closing. One thing to mention is you can only it can only you can only receive as, um, as much back as the closing costs are, right? So let's say you you agree the seller agrees to give you three percent back because you know you did a ten percent down payment, so they agree to do three percent back as a seller's credit of the purchase price. But your your closing costs are only ten thousand, and let's say that credit is twelve thousand. You're only going to be able to get back ten thousand. Okay. I hope that doesn't. I hope I explained that correctly. But yeah, yeah, that makes sense. You can, yeah, you can only receive a seller's credit for the amount of your closing cost. It can't go towards your down payment. Uh, you can do a gift for your down payment but the seller's credit can only be for the amount up to the closing cost. But Jamil, can I get you, what your company is offering? Can I get the, the 10,500, if I'm buying a $300,000 house, I get mm -hmm. my 3.5% grant from you that I don't need to pay back. Can I use that towards my down payment? Yeah. So that, that is the, that's the, like the intentions of it is okay. essentially like hundred percent financing. Good. Um, and, and, and what's funny or not funny, what's great is in addition to that, you can get a seller's credit to cover your closing costs. So you're going to essentially walk into a home with no money. With zero money. In, the, in the perfect Jamil. scenario. This is where I was going with this, yeah. because I have a lot of people that are not buying houses. And their reason is that I don't have money for the down right. payment. And I, I remember one of them telling me that, oh, my friend told me that I needed 40% to put oh. as a down payment on the house. I'm like, what are we talking I've heard, about? I've heard 20%, but 40%, no, that's, uh, that's a... Yeah. I was shocked. The, the thing is, yeah. people get their information, Okachi, like with their neighbors, their friends. Yeah. And you don't even know where they, they also got their information. Go and talk to the, the neighbor that never bought a house. Right, here, right. especially a neighbor who never bought a house who's renting with you in an apartment, and then right. they're sitting at the parlement with you eating some taho, some couscous, and, and all of that, and, and fish, baked fish, and all that, and they're talking, drinking beers, and telling you stories. And that's what you're taking into consideration, guys. Right. This is the reason why Jamil is always happy to come and talk to you. And you see, it's the second time he's here. He does this because he wants to help us be educated. You know, even as a realtor, I learned a lot tonight. Even as an investor for Freddie, I'm sure he learned a lot tonight. And some of you, I hope you learned something. If you did, please write something in the comment section. At least to encourage Jamil for everything that we've learned here today. So don't go get your information. If you want to know something about medicine, you cannot go talk to a mechanic. Hmm. Guys, go, you guys, you guys, you need water, go to the fountain, right? So please come ask us questions. My colleague and friend, Eve Dikume is on this live today. He's based in New York, but he covers the entire United States and France as well. If you have questions, he'll be happy to answer your questions. But guys, don't go out there and try to be smart. Come and ask us 1,000 questions and then go around and go buy the houses with other, other realtors out there. We do have families to feed as well. So if you go and talk to Yves Dikume and he gives you all the information, please get back to him when you're ready to buy a house, no matter where in the United States, he can assist you. Same for me. Ask us questions. If we don't have the answers, 
We'll go to the lender and get the answers for you. Please speak to experienced investors. Don't be discouraged that you don't have a down payment to buy a house. With or without the down payment, we just learned today that you can still get a house. Jamil just explained that to you. With this program that they have, you get up to 3.5%, which is what you need for an, for an FHA loan. With 580 minimum credit score. So stop telling me, oh, my credit is low, Coach Lisa. I'm working on my credit. I need to get to 700, even if your credit is 580, but you're renting right now. If you live with your parents, or if you live with your husband, or your husband to be, or your wife, and, and you don't have to pay rent, it's one thing. But if you have to pay rent, please get to Jamil, do the math with him. See what your monthly payment is going to be like. If it's going to be same as your rent, stop renting. Because mm. there are lots of benefits that you get at the end of the year that rent will not give you. So Absolutely. please, um, I know you guys have more questions about LLCs. And Jamil wanted to talk to you about DSCR loans and all, all of that. But I don't think we're going to have time for that today. We're going to hope that Jamil is going to be kind enough and generous enough with his time to want to come back so we can dive deeper into creative, um, exotic ways of financing um, investment properties. We're not going to go back to talking about primary residences at that point. We're going to go to level two, guys, and we hope that you're going to be there. And if somebody doesn't understand something when we go to level two, tell them to go back to this video. It's on our page, The Smart Move. <laughs> Right, it's on our page, uh, personal pages. Freddie is tagged on this, I'm tagged on this. Coach Lisa, YouTube channel, Facebook, go back there. So, guys, I'm mm -hmm. gonna give you the floor. Um, I'm gonna start with you, Jamil. If you have something to say to this community today, um, you know, how can they find you? You know, what are you know, one last thing that you can tell them to encourage them to buy their first home or to yeah. buy more properties and build generational wealth with, you know, a portfolio in real estate? Yeah, so, you know, I think uh, first thing I, I wanna say is, you know, thank you for the opportunity. Um, you know, I, I think that uh, buying real estate oftentimes is, can be tricky, can be, you know, people are getting a little discouraged or they feel like it's something they can't do, but just please know that it's really not as hard as you think. Um, you know, plenty of people have done it. Plenty of people continue to do it. And in fact, the most successful people are the ones who are heavily invested in real estate. And, um, and, you know, like, like coach Lisa said, you know, just, you know, try not to do so much research on your own or get lost in the internet or in, in this and that definitely reach out to professionals, people who do this day in and day out. The market is constantly changing. Programs are always constantly changing. Guidelines are always constantly changing. So it's always good to have someone um, on your side to help you navigate uh, this world, you know? Yeah. Um, and, you know, again, it just feels good to, to be here and to, you know, hopefully lay some education out. Uh, I hope everyone out there uh, has learned something. Um, and, you know, I'm always available as, as, some people on the stream, maybe I've spoken to you in the past, you know, you can always reach me uh, through text, phone call, weekends, nights. Um, yeah. I'm always available. So, And your phone number, Jamil, oh. is on the screen right now. If anybody yeah. wants to write down the number, 908-283-9933. Um, I hope I got that right. And Jamil That's is correct. very, very flexible. That's the reason why I work with him. You guys know me. Those who work with me know me. At 2 a.m., I'm sending you answers and questions and all of that. And I don't I, want, I sometimes wonder if you sleep. I honestly, I'm like, is she, is she sleeping? <laughs> that, cash, flow, cash flow never sleeps, John. No, I'm sorry. Uh, I, I, I will sleep when I die. But Dang. anyway, I mean, the Jamil is my go-to lender when it comes to, like, um, having great options and a great communication and great flexibility and all of that. I love the fact that, you know, when I'm under pressure with a client and we found a good deal, I send you a message at 7 p.m. You are responding and you're sending me a pre-approval later uh, a few minutes after that. I mean, I don't think there's any other lender that I've worked with out there that is so fast and so professional and so uh, honest and so transparent. 
And you know, um, Thank and you. It, you know, there's no. You told me one day that you don't get paid more when you charge a higher interest rate or anything like that. You don't get no. paid more, so you always putting the best options out there for us and thank you so much for that i love i love our partnership and i truly appreciate it and just for all of you guys out there to know um i don't get paid to work with jamil let, let it be clear right. <laughs> i don't get paid we're not allowed as realtors to get any kind of kickback i think that's respa right that's Correct. Respa law. Correct. jamil is not allowed to give me a dollar a dime you know for referring you to him just so you know, I don't have, you know, some benefit or something by sending you to him. It's just because he is flexible and will send us that pre-approval letter that we need as quickly as possible. And he will also tell you the truth. And on top of everything, if your file is not looking good and you have to go spend some time and come back, he will tell you what you should work on. He will help you take that credit up or your finances or your income. So Really, you're the best, Jamil. Thank you so much for that. No. I really appreciate your time. Thank you. And I likewise, you know, I, I I greatly appreciate the partnership. And, you know, hopefully uh, we could definitely help more families get yeah. into new homes. And, you know, it's never too early to start the conversation, even if you feel like you're in the beginning stages, you, you don't know where to start. That's that's a great talking point. Let's let's, you yeah. know, let's start somewhere. Let's see where we can go. And you know, oftentimes people are surprised. Hey, you know, I didn't think that I can get pre-approved. I didn't think that I was ready. And then, yeah. you know, it turns out they can, they're ready to go tomorrow. That's, that's so. amazing. And Jamil, you also mentioned that you're willing to do in person. Um, you want to, if you guys let me know, let us know here in the comment yeah. section, those who were with us tonight, tell us if you're interested in having a, a, a seminar or a conference or a meetup with the lender, um, the lenders, the realtors, you know, all the people in this business, the insurance, um, the inspectors, the appraisers. If you guys are interested in coming together at a real estate conference, you know, um, we will definitely make that happen for you. So please let us know in the comment section if that's something you're interested in. Uh, we can work on that. So um, thank you, Shetty, um, to give your closing words here. What can you tell uh, those of our viewers who are still hesitating, you know, um, in, in terms of buying their first house or buying their first investment property, what can you tell them before we come back next time and dive deeper into investment, uh, financing investment properties? Um, well, I'm going to say it's really uh, simple. Like Jamil just said, it's never like you will never know what you can qualify for or if you can afford. Like even my first home, with all the cash that I had, I didn't really know if I was able to qualify. And down the road, I bought multiple other properties following the same process. So you, you also can do the same thing. It's not like rocket science or magic. You just have to get out there and get the momentum going. You buy your first, and then it's just going to follow. And next time, we are going to talk about more creative uh, finance, because a lot of people are worried about like the financing part. Mm -hmm. That's even me, as of today, I would like to buy like $300 million <laughs> building that I don't know where I'm going to come up with like All of $30 million. Us, yeah. dollars. <laughs> for the down payment. Mm -hmm. But some people out there, they have like some options like that can get you to at least a five um, five unit apartment without having to put down a lot of money. That's amazing. Thank you so much for that encouragement, Freddie. That just shows you guys that there are options out there. You don't know what you don't know, but go ask questions to the right people. Go to the experts. Yeah go to those who are willing to work with you. And I'm going to repeat, guys, please, let's be serious. Do not take advantage of people's time. When I tell you that there's free coaching available, you can come and talk to me with a free 30-minute session. Please come prepared and even come to the session because half of you, you book the sessions, you don't even show up and it's free oh, and it's my time. You know, you guys are going to say, oh, Coach Lisa parle trop, elle se fâche trop, she's getting, you know, she's talking too much. I just have to remind you guys, our time.
Time is precious. We are investors. We work hard. And so if you sign up to have a free session with me, be there. And if you're there, be prepared. And if you're prepared and I give you my knowledge and my time, be prepared to work with me. If you're not going to do that, go take your neighbor, your cousin, your friend, your classmate, whoever, go ask your questions to them and have them help you so that I can spend time taking care of other people that trust me to be their realtor. So guys, today it was the, the fifth episode of the Smart Move podcast. And we were with Jamil and he was telling us about how we can finance our portfolio, our real estate portfolio. We're going to be back again very soon. We'll give you a new date where he can come back and we can dive deeper into a level two of creative financing. I hope we, you love this episode and you're going to uh, share with more people so that we can be many of us taking advantage of this. Thank you for your trust. We are always here to serve you. Keep in mind that you can achieve your dream. Yes, it's possible. And yes, you can. Happy Valentine's Day in advance to everyone, guys. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.